Our guest today entered the accounting profession at a younger age than anyone I have ever met and never looked back. Khalil Bouban led lease accounting change at one of the biggest companies in the world. And now his passion is sharing what he has learned with others. We all came to conclusion that we need to address this with the, with the SEC and we involved some of the big four firms like Deloitte and KPMG on these calls. And finally, we drafted a letter technically to the SEC. They then met with us on a call and we kind of voiced our opinion about what's going on and, and what our proposals were. And they said, okay, we'll get back to you. And I would say within about a month, they came back and said, we are going to give you an official letter from the SEC that you can use with your auditors. Hello, and welcome to the Lease Alert, where we have conversations with the smartest, most interesting people at the intersection of real estate, leasing, and accounting. I'm your host, Matt Waters. Let's learn something together. Khalil, welcome to the Lease Alert podcast. Thank you, Matt. Pleasure to be here. And uh, with that kind of introduction, I'm going to have you do all my introductions, personal <laughs> and professional. <laughs> all right. Happy to do that. So I will have to give a few things about Khalil that I will let the audience know up front. Khalil not only started into the accounting profession younger than any person I've ever met, I think I can say with certainty, he is also the only person I've ever met that has a accounting oriented license plate. So if you live in Atlanta, you see a car driving around, you might think it's doctor something. I've heard some people say that it's driving and crying the band, but actually his license plate, Khalil, I'll just let you tell what the license plate says. So it has the DR and CR, the letter N for N. So debits and credits, obviously, for <laughs> <laughs> what it's really meant to be. But I also sometimes get doctor and what, and I say doctor and coroner as a joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, yeah, doctor and coroner, that, I would rather have debit and credit, I think, yeah, doctor sure. and coroner. But, um, <laughs> but driving and crying, that was one that our VP of marketing at CoStar Real Estate Manager, he thought it was driving and crying, a rock band. So I thought that was a pretty good guess, too. I listened to that group after he mentioned it, and I'm starting to like them, so maybe I'll, I'll repurpose that <laughs> oh, <laughs> or say that it means yeah. two things. Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> then, we can, then we can keep people guessing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Khalil, I've already teased this enough, you know, saying that you got into accounting at an early age. <laughs> so why don't you tell us about that? How did you get into accounting? Growing up in, in Israel, when you get to high school, you you have to select a major, and really there's a couple of main tracks. One is to go into, you know, engineering and IT and that kind of stuff. And the second one is to do office management and accounting to select one of those two tracks. And I kind of had the passion for accounting from seeing maybe accounting movies, you know, uh, movies with accountants in them. Plus I had a family relative that was also an accountant that she basically talked about her job and stuff like that. So I had some kind of passion towards it to begin with. And I wanted to do that. When it came time in high school to select my major, and it's just a stepping stone towards college, so that way you have a head start, I said, I definitely want to do accounting. However, what I found out is, you know, when I was about to sign up for the course, is that that particular track, it's usually the guys it tend to go towards the IT and, and engineering, and the ladies tend to do the accounting and office management, those kind of things. So I was almost going to be the only guy in the class. So I kind of buddied up with a couple of my buddies and said, you know, so it's not difficult. Let's all of us sign up for it. So it'll be three of us and, and we kind of, it doesn't look weird or anything like that. So we agreed on that and we all went and talked to our advisors and all of that. So the first day of class, we were all sitting down and the teacher for the accounting and, and office management came in and said, okay, anybody that's here for the accounting office management, stay, everybody else go ahead and leave. And I look around and my two buddies had left already. They did not <laughs> sign up for the class. And for the next three years, I was doing accounting. And part of doing that course, you also needed to learn how to use the typewriter and be fast at it. Now, this is not going to be a story where I tell you I was the fastest typewriter. As a matter of fact, I was horrible at it, <laughs> you know, with the changing the lines and the ribbons, you know, back in the late, late eighties, early nineties, <laughs> it was a, quite a challenge, but I toughed through it because I just loved accounting and I'm happy I did. 
Awesome. Yeah. Well, we're all glad that you did too. It is a funny story thinking, and I think we can all think back to high school and, and those situations where you look around and you're the only guy there or, or the only girl there or something like that. It actually, I think, brings up a, an issue that prevails even today. You know, not so much boys versus girls, you know, because I know a lot of men who are accountants and I, you know, I know a lot of women right. who are accountants. But, you know, the, I think the issue that's still around today is this concept of there's two tracks related to somebody that's good at math. You know, I mean, is it really accurate to say, well, you can take in the STEM track, you know, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, take a business track, which in many cases will include accounting, right? I actually heard this this on a webinar the other day. Somebody said, well, why don't we call it STEAM? Why, why don't we change the acronym from STEM to STEAM, and then we can include the A for accounting? I think that's a, a fantastic idea because folks that are good at math and thinking through complex scenarios, you know, people that like order, they like the the order of things. I mean, that can very easily propel you into architecture or engineering, mathematics, even some types of medicine, you know, right, to some extent, chemistry, right, or accounting. And so, you know, really, I, I think that is a good idea. I, I don't know that I've heard anybody else use that STEAM acronym very prevalently, but hey, I mean, I think it's great. And we really do as a profession, as a as accountants, I think we really need to talk in a more interesting way about what we do, right? I mean, the stereotype of you're meeting somebody for the first time, you say, well, what do you do? Then they say, well, what do you do? And you say, I'm a CPA. And if it's anywhere in the first quarter of the year, they're like, oh, I know you're, you're really busy filing tax returns this time of year, aren't you? And, you know, I know for me, at least I'm like, actually, no, I, um, I haven't filed a tax return in my whole career, <laughs> right? But we need to be a little better at being more interesting about, you know, talking about our profession and break down some of those stereotypes that really go way past the way it was, like, I guess, in Israel in those days, right? Male versus female. And, you know, the stereotypes today persist, but, it, but I think it's more into like what's interesting, <laughs> what's exciting and what's not exciting. And accounting can actually be very exciting. I, I totally agree. I mean, I'm pretty sure, I, I don't say I was groundbreaking or anything like that, but now there's more folks, over, you know, in Israel are going through these courses and it's no longer one way or the other. It kind of evolved, obviously. Uh, but I'll say that, you know, there's a lot of stereotypes, like you said, about accounting and, and we're seeing that in the market where there's less and less people getting into that field because maybe they don't think there is a payoff for that or anything like that. To me, when I got here to the United States, you know, I just wanted to continue my journey and I wanted to get the CPA exam done so I can get my CPA certification, obviously. So the funny thing happened is that when I started studying for the CPA, I was like, you know, it's just one thing. I'll go through it and it'll be done. And it was a long journey and a challenging journey because I did a couple of things that weren't sound at the time. I kind of started with BEC, the one part, and then I mm -hmm. said, you know what? Let me try to speed it up and I'll do the audit and FAR on the same day. So I'll mm -hmm. study for both of them. They're related. And, you know, obviously you have your, your financials and you have somebody auditing the financials. So it seems logical to have them both as one study and just go take them together. So I went in and, and sat for the uh, FAR one and that's four hours took a half an hour break and jumped into auditing. And that's another four hours. So it was a nightmare oh, boy. <laughs> to do them yeah. both at the same day. Needless to say, the studying, and by the time I got to the second one, it just, did, I did not fare well. And so the, the, obviously the thing is, if you don't get back right into it and you get discouraged and you wait, they start to drop off, even the ones that you passed. So five years later, I picked it up again. This time I did it the right way where I did one at a time. And I kind of got to the far one and I got a 74, which was one point away from passing, oh, which man. is 75. I was like, <laughs> darn it. But this time I did not let it sit. And, and I went back and took it again and passed and got all my formal parts and passed the CPA exam. That to say, though, is even though it's challenging, if it was easy, everybody else would be doing it. But it's challenging, but it's also rewarding. It's it's kind of like the top of the mountain, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to climb a mountain and reach the top. So 
it is challenging, but I think it is also rewarding and satisfying to to accomplish the top of the profession type of thing. Yeah. So it, it's definitely worth it. Absolutely. I agree wholeheartedly. I'd say if anything over the course of my career has, you know, if any one thing has given me an edge, it's that CPA credential because it instantly establishes credibility, right? Yeah. And you really can't pass that exam without showing an incredible amount of dedication to, you know, getting the subject matter crammed into your brain and and then the discipline to do that in the right order and and have some strategy to, you know, to take the um the exam perhaps not on the same day if you have that option. It really just shows in addition to mastering concepts, right, which is very important, it right. also shows that you can set your mind to something and accomplish it. And I think that that really shows up in when it comes time to apply for opportunities and promotions and, and things like that. I mean, it is just instant credibility for, quite frankly, the rest of your career. <laughs> you will have that. We hear a lot of talk, I'd say, in the media about taking away some of the barriers to entry and Students don't want to have to sit through that exam process. I just encourage people to rethink that. It is hard. Yes, it's hard. But it it also proves something. And you'll have that for the rest of your life. So it's hard, but but in my experience, it's worth it. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and one tip I'll say is the exam may look scary because it's a lot of information. But it, one analogy was it's like an ocean that's about one foot deep. So you don't really have to get deep knowledge on everything. It's just very, very vast. There's a lot of things to know, but you really don't need to to kind of get really deep into any specific item. You just, you need to know everything. Because it, it, reality is, it's just, you get the test, you get your license, but wherever you end up working, you obviously you, you expand your experience specific to that particular specialties. So that's really where you get all, all that information. But having the certificate is weeds out people that are in it just for no passion or anything like that versus people that are really passionate about it and willing to to kind of go through all the challenges. And, you know, the one mistake that I did when, when I had the 74 instead of 75, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to focus on basically the government accounting because like who goes through the CPA to end up working for the government? You know, that's <laughs> very low pay and all of that. So I kind of avoided it, but it seemed like when I st- took the exam, every single question was about government. <laughs> Maybe it's just because I wasn't right. prepared for it. It seemed that way, but <laughs> so I would say touch on everything and you don't really need to focus on specific things, but just touch on everything and you should do fine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I remember thinking the same thing about lease accounting. I was like, well, who, who's ever uh, going to use these bright line <laughs> tests about capital versus operating leases? I mean, I'm going to memorize this and then promptly forget it and Never used again in my whole career. And of course, as you know, now I've worked in lease accounting specifically for about 20 years. So Khalil, I want to get into some more recent experience, not the most recent experience, but I do want to talk about your time at the Home Depot. I also worked at the Home Depot and on my first day, you know, at a big company like that, I mean, the corporate headquarters, we call it the store support center. But there were thousands of people that work in the store support center for Home Depot in Atlanta. Three big buildings, you know, multiple floors. And so orientation pulls people from all different departments. You know, you can think of that as as just any big company orientation, just kind of paint the picture here. But it turns out when I went through orientation, there were people there from IT and HR and the store centric departments like, like merchandising and things like that. And there was one other person there from the accounting area, not exactly the same area of accounting, but that one other person was Khalil. When we did our introductions that day, we both stood up and said, you know, I'm Matt Waters. I'm going uh, into accounting here at Home Depot. And and then a few minutes later, Khalil stands up and he's, he says, I'm Khalil and I'm going into accounting here at the Home Depot. And so at lunch that day, I think we ended up talking as we we're the only people there from accounting. So just a bit of a fun story. And, and now, you know, often on we have worked together for many years, but Khalil, I'd love to hear about your journey, about how you made it from that high school class in Israel, you know, on through to the Home Depot and and then actually tell us a little bit about what you did and ultimately the biggest project you took on at Home Depot. 
Yeah, I would say uh, when I started at Home Depot, I uh, started as a staff accountant initially and kind of progressed th- from there to you know senior accountant. Any accountant listening to this will know kind of the progression, senior accountant to supervisor. And ultimately, Matt had uh, you know was the uh, manager for real estate accounting and, and uh, leases, and, and he dealt with leases at the time. But when he left, there was a, a manager in between us that also ended up leaving, and I took on that role for lease accounting. And it, to me, it was a natural progression because it was kind of keep getting more challenging and more challenging. And when that spot became open, I was like, sure, I'll take a shot at this. How hard can it be? You know, it's just lease accounting. It's 840. It's, you know, you don't have to worry about operating leases. Just focus on finance leases. You're done, you know. Lo and behold, a year later, everything kind of turns upside down. 842 gets introduced. And now you got to start upending everything. You got to look for software kind of do everything that you have to do, which involves talking to all your partners, you know, the the FP&A, the uh, reporting folks, you have to talk to procurement, kind of get a handle on all the equipment and leases that Home Depot has. And to kind of put in perspective, we had about 1,100 property leases, but 60,000 equipment leases. Mm. So that was a big, big challenge. And property leases tend to be a little bit easier to manage they're pretty straight out. You have your fair market value given to you by appraisers and, and you have the information that you need and, and the contracts are easy to read. They're pretty standard because their legalese is, is kind of universal. But then when you deal with the equipment ones, it's all over the place. You're dealing with printers, you're dealing with forklifts, you're dealing with trucks. You know, it could be anything you can think of. And and now you got to corral or that because it wasn't one department managing all the equipment. It was different departments managing different type of equipment. The contracts were different languages, or not languages, well, some of them were in, in different languages as well for international stores. You had to kind of understand all of those and kind of try to make sure you're not missing anything, trying to analyze them to see are they leases, are they you know regular contracts, are they embedded leases. All that stuff was brand new to the point that even our auditors, KPMG at the time, they were learning as we were learning, right? So everything got scrutinized. Everything was back and forth mm-hmm. because every, we were all doing it for the first time in 2019. So it was a, a, you know, absolutely a nightmare, but also an awesome challenge because mm. it kind of made me even grow and say, you know what? I'm going to go right through this. And I kind of grabbed every article that's out there, everything that you can read about it and learned it to the point that I'm like, I can do this in my sleep now. Or yeah. at least now I can. But then yeah. it was a lot of growing pains, but but I'm glad I went through it. Uh, it, it really was not easy. And yeah. kudos to any company that got it right and, mm-hmm. and uh, were able to go through that. Yeah, I, I love the way you kind of framed that up. You can look at it, and many times living through some big project and big change like that feels like a nightmare. But if you really change your perspective, you know, just a few degrees, right, you can see oh, wow, this is actually a huge opportunity, right? For sure. And a challenge. But hey, you know, I'd say that opportunity in many ways, regardless of how where it comes from, you know, in this case for you, it was through lease accounting. That kind of huge challenge, huge opportunity can actually help you learn so much about your own abilities. It expands what you thought was possible from a lot of different perspectives, your own analytical skills and ability, your project management skills, frankly, your your people skills. You just mentioned there you had to pull together a lot of different departments. Uh, you had to communicate with folks all over the organization, people that weren't used to thinking about leases from an accounting standpoint. Absolutely. And, and you had to do all that under pressure with a deadline, right? And like almost every situation like that where, you, where it's a trial by fire or, you know, it could seem like a nightmare up front. When you get on the other side of it, it feels really satisfying. Like a right? victory, or yes, for <laughs> sure. And it's very rewarding. I mean, part of the journey was also I kind of joined FEI as a to be able to, to kind of talk to all my peers and do roundtables with other companies. And we kind of did work in sessions to talk about what each company was going through. Like I said, it was brand new for everybody. Mm-hmm. So everybody had to figure things out. There were some even issues where we didn't agree with what the SCC was you know, giving initially. Mm-hmm. And we even signed a, a letter you know, from all these companies and we forwarded to SCC and they kind of gave some concessions 
uh, about uh, certain things. And but I'm saying it was just the reward of kind of going through that experience and and gaining all this knowledge and information, and also getting appreciation because. I was known at some point, they took my first name and added the word Lise to it. And because Game of Thrones was going on, they started calling me Khaleesi, you know, Khalees, <laughs> Khalil Lise type of thing. So, so I even got that. Uh, and wow. you know, the CFO acknowledged it at the end. Thank you letter to, you know, an email, thank you email to myself and, for, and, you know, with the team and all that for us getting a company like Home Depot through that. So it was very rewarding. Wow. That's incredible. Recognition from the CFO of literally a, you know, I don't know exactly, around a hundred billion dollar company, right? That's a big deal. Congratulations for that. I wanted to pull out a couple of things you just said there. You mentioned you worked through FEI to influence the guidance that was coming out from the SEC. So just in case somebody's listening, you know, we use tons of acronyms in this profession, in the accounting profession, and well, I guess any profession. But FEI, that's a professional organization. It's called Financial Executives International. And FEI, among other things, has uh, CPE events, training courses. They host conferences. They host roundtables. And they act as an industry group to accumulate feedback to send to agencies, you know, government agencies, the Securities and Exchange Commission that Khalil just mentioned. That's the SEC. And also, you know, I'd say pseudo government agencies like the FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board. But anyway, ultimately, we won't get into the whole codification of accounting standards and and the whole process here. But I mean, in many ways, the rules that the SEC puts out, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the accounting standards that the FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board put out. They basically, for public companies, act like laws. I mean, if you don't comply with these guidelines and regulations, you risk your company being taken off the stock exchange. You risk, to some extent, personal liability if, you know, if there's fraud involved and, and that kind of thing. So, so, I mean, this is a big deal. And getting to influence that process through an important organization like FEI, actually influencing you know, the SEC... That is also a big deal. So I, I would love to hear about well, how did that shape up? How were those meetings? What did you do in the in the roundtables and, and crafting those memos that you just mentioned? So basically, you know, we were looking at different type of as far as if you should look for the lease inception and if you should if take the discount rate at lease inception versus you know the current discount rate and adoption and those kind of things. And at the time, there were some verbiage there in the in the standard that was unclear. And some companies, I mean. Not to mention, you know, I suppose I'll, I'll just throw a couple of names out there. We had Disney on there. We had Walmart on there. So obviously big companies. We weren't talking about mom and pop's operations. And a lot of them, like Walmart, had you know international presence. And so different leases that are so old and, and those kind of things. And, and the same thing with Home Depot. Home Depot doesn't sign leases for a year or two. They're usually 5, 10, 20, 25 99 year leases. So all of those things are going to be something that is going to affect us and, and, and those other companies. So we, we talked about it back and forth, back and forth, and, and how difficult it was going to be to comply with that. And we all came to conclusion that we need to address this with the, with the SEC. And we involved some of the big four firms like Deloitte and KPMG on these calls. And finally, we drafted a letter technically to the SEC. And on the bottom, it was signed by all our C CFOs and, and those kind of things. And we submitted to the SEC. They then met with us on a call, and we kind of voiced our opinion about what's going on and, and what our proposals were. And they said, okay, we'll get back to you. And I would say within about a month, they came back and said, we are going to give you an official letter from the SEC that you can use with your auditors. We're not going to change the verbiage of the standard but you can change it to adapt to what you want to do as a policy. And here's a letter from the SEC saying it's okay to do so. Mm -hmm. And so when we did that, we actually shared the letter on the FEI site for other companies to use as well. And But but basically, we were the driving force into one of the technical accounting issues. Uh, changes wow. Or, you know, <laughs> well, that's cool. <laughs> that's just incredible because, you know, basically you, you use the knowledge and experience that, that you had gathered right at Home Depot you combine that with some of the other biggest companies in the whole world, right? 
and ultimately influenced what's considered appropriate from an accounting standard and financial reporting perspective at, at the highest level in the United States, right? So again, I, I go back to some of the the comments we made earlier. The stereotype is that accounting is boring and you're sitting typing on a keyboard or, or you know, maybe even have a green shade over your eyes and and taking down, uh, you know, journal entries with a pencil, right, is, is kind of the ultimate stereotype. But then, you know, you just mentioned these, these major meetings involving executives at the biggest companies in the world and basically influencing government type decisions, right? I, you know, I know we could get into the nuances of, of what's actual law and what's an accounting standard, but, but hey, it is a big deal to be influencing the FASB and the SEC. And you got to do that all because you had developed this passion and career in accounting. And uh, yeah, I, th- I think that's incredible. I also think just perhaps to be encouraging to some others that are listening, you know, you might be thinking, well, Khalil had that opportunity because lease accounting came along. You know, what are the chances of lease accounting ever changing to that extent again? I'm not going to be able to work on something that interesting. And I would say I, I disagree with that, if that's what you're thinking, because things change all the time. In fact, another guest on the podcast this season was Kelly Anarud. Kelly is with RGP, and she worked on the lease accounting transition on behalf of RGP's clients. Now she's heavily focused on sustainability and the ESG discussion that is ongoing, right? And I won't get into all of that. I just encourage you, if you are looking for a challenge, right? Like Khalil mentioned, if you're kind of hungry for that that adventure, that challenge, take a look at what's going on in ESG right now or sustainability and think about how you could potentially help out with you know, the company that you're working at now, or perhaps a, you know, a different company or different clients, uh, a lot of people are really looking to address ESG now. And it has a very similar feeling to the early days of the lease accounting transition. And, and sure. Kelly and I talk about that in the, in the other podcast. So again, I won't belabor the point here, but I, I think that is a huge opportunity right now. Yeah, I mean, and RevRec was also happening at the, revenue recognition was also happening at the same time as lease accounting. So the project and the opportunities are always there. You just have to get rid of your fear of the typewriter, like I did, and just, to, <laughs> you know, follow your passion. You know, yeah. one thing Michael Jordan said that I always found interesting, he said, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. Mm. You know, it's basically something you enjoy. You don't think of it as frustrating or anything like that. You just take the challenge and you strive right through it. And like Matt said, the opportunities will always be there. Something else is coming down the pipe. So yeah, for sure. That leads me to my next question, Khalil. I would like to hear, I don't think I said up front, you know, Khalil now works at CoStar Real Estate Manager. He helps our customers. We have hundreds and hundreds of customers that we help with the automation of lease accounting and, and lease administration for both equipment and real estate. And so Khalil is a very important part of that process. He actually leads the center of excellence for lease accounting at CoStar Real Estate Manager. And so that's just a a brief overview of your job now, Khalil. I would love to hear your thoughts on, on both now and then looking forward into the future. What are you passionate about working on? We have established you're passionate about accounting and have achieved success in this area, but what do you look forward to now? What gets you up in the morning and keeps you you coming back for more? I got to say that I always thought I would, you know, be doing debits and credits and month end entries and those kind of things. But once I went through that lease accounting project, I enjoyed it so much that I said, you know what, you know, Matt had approached me saying, hey, there's an opportunity at CoStar if you really like this, because even though Matt left, he still stopped by Home Depot because they have a great cafeteria <laughs> and, <laughs> and we would meet there and we chat. Um, it was more to see the people, less about know, the I food, know. I would say, but yeah. <laughs> for, sure, for sure. He was well known at that point. So everybody would come, hey, Matt is here. So we all would meet. But the point is that now I, I, you know, I'm able to do, you know, this, this project on a grander scale because every one of our clients is, you know, at the time when they were adopting the standard now, maybe the private companies or failed implementations that are coming to CoStar, they're all going through the same steps that I went through. So I can share my my experience with them and, and what I learned from it and and try to help them navigate and get to, to where we got as smooth as possible. 
with the caveat that speaking of acronyms, I always say that whenever I tell them something, I say CYA, but in that context, it stands consult your auditors, uh, <laughs> not, not the other CYAs, but because we don't give accounting advice necessarily, but we do tell clients what, what other clients would do or, or what we think they could try. But obviously with clear with their auditors and, and their management and all of that. But the whole idea was to get other people to the promised land as, as easy as possible and as smooth as possible. So that's really something that I take pride in and, and like to help other folks that way. And for my future, I think at some point, whether at retirement or when I'm not doing this anymore, I probably would like to go to the classroom and, and be a, a, an accounting teacher or professor or whatever you want to call it. Cool. And teach other the new generation, hopefully, to ignite a passion in other folks to do this and go into accounting. So that's probably where my future, st- you know, will be maybe 10, 15 years, something like that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it. And in, in case anybody forgets, what does CYA stand for? <laughs> Consult your auditors. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, Khalil, thank you so much for being here today. As always, I really enjoy talking with you. And folks, that's Khalil Bouban. He works at CoStar Real Estate Manager. He's a lease accounting superhero. Reach out to him. I'll put his information in the show notes. Thank you for listening to The Lease Alert. I'd be grateful if you would like and subscribe wherever you listen. Until next time, keep learning and leasing.